Hello Defcon, welcome to your house as my house, use of offensive enclaves in adversarial operations. My name is Dmitry Snashkov and I'm part of Partivity Attack and Penetration Testing Team, where I have a chance to do tooling, offensive research, and automation. Shout out to my team at Partivity for making that happen. So today we're going to talk about SDX technology as it applies to offensive operations. Uh, being part of the offensive team and tasked with testing, I sometimes find myself uh, and we as a team find ourselves on unknown boxes. And sometimes we need to leverage the technology that exists there to be able to withstand the uh, kind of, you know, the onslaught of EDR inspections or defensive technology inspections. And so SGX technology uh, here is was a curious case when a developer was using SGX technology to protect uh, trusted credentials. And so the box was instrumented uh, with SGX enclaves, um, which we thought, why not use them? And how can we use them to further our goals of bringing payloads and taking care of uh, uh, secure communication for us? But first things first, SGX is a technology developed by Intel Corporation to essentially protect specific code or data from disclosure or modification to adversarial parties. Adversarial parties defined by Intel or SDX technology is anybody who is uh, running in non-ring three. For example, privileged system code, operating system, virtual hypervisor, managers, BIOS, uh, all the things that uh, kind of work around the hardware. Um, and so SDX enclaves were born, uh, a technology that uh, solved the issue of protecting areas or tries to solve the issue of protected areas of execution uh, and increase security uh, on platforms that are considered to be compromised from uh, all the context that runs uh, around them. So SGX, as we've defined, uh, SGX enclave is a trusted code. And it's also linked into application. So the application kind of runs in two modes, uh, split personality modes, right? One is the untrusted part of the code, another is trusted part of the code. The trusted or safe uh, part of the code runs in the SGX enclave which, we, enclave, which we construct, and we interact with underlying uh, bootstrapping and orche orchestration uh, platform to be able to execute um, or reach into the trusted area and execute uh, uh, very specific operations uh, from the untrusted memory, which is our application. That's possible by uh, SGX of introducing two, uh, two new opcodes of switching in and out of the trusted area over CPU, which is locked to, uh, to the enclave, where enclave is encrypted by uh, CPU key. And so uh, this technology is very uh, kind of prevalent in the high security environments, uh, obviously part of the, uh, you know, wherever uh, Intel core processor uh, six plus generation lives uh, on laptops, business uh, servers and data centers, but also in cloud virtual machines, namely we found it on Azure DC level trusted computing machines, right? And so if we find ourselves as, as operators on those machines, we might be able to use some of that uh, protection for our purposes. So the offensive goals for, for us here uh, is kind of twofold. Uh, first is understand the technology, how to construct uh, the application so we can actually invoke, uh, you know, SGX and use enclaves to store our data, which is payloads or uh, other things. Uh, also use uh, SGX technology and SDK to try and secure communications with our C2 without revealing uh, keys that we use for our payload encryption. And in the process, try to kind of, you know, have the EDR uh, divert attention from us uh, by splitting the uh, kind of the deployment model between several components that are not uh, fully assembled or inter in introspected. And so um, in this case, we're gonna do uh, Windows as an example. We're gonna create an, uh, a system called Xclave or uh, kind of you know, design a method of communication between our cradle uh, to load securely our payloads, store them in, uh, in the enclave on the box, 
but also hide the algorithm of encryption and the keys that kind of travel back and forth uh, in clear text. And so the Windows is the example in this case, uh, but the Linux uh, side will be pretty much the same in concepts, although implementation may be a little bit different. And uh, hopefully we're gonna have fun going through those uh, exercises. Uh, one thing to mention is that this talk is not about SGX vulnerabilities or uh, SGS, SGX uh, deep dives. We're gonna touch on some of the relevant uh, parts, but uh, uh, refer to other great talks uh, on that matter. The SGX components that will be interesting for us uh, will be the platform software that gets installed to kind of interact with uh, Enclave. If, if we're dropping into a box that has uh, the appropriate type of CPU uh, and we're on Windows, Microsoft Windows machine, then operating system will, would have already have the driver for it um, because that's you know that's a standard uh, update process for it um, but you could uh, obviously have more type of you know uh, have other type of platform software if you're operating directly in the environment that uh, SG sgx enclaves are used by developers to kind of help their applications be more secure so the driver is there and the orchestration software such as attestation service which uh, talks about and, and takes care of the uh, kind of signing and verifying the enclaves themselves to the owner uh, and to the system, i.e. the CPU. And also the second part is the SDK, which we will use as part of the software development to create this application, which will utilize enclaves. There are two SDKs. We're gonna take a look at Intel for the most part, but Open Enclave is also available for our purposes. And so the outcome of our efforts would be an application or a set of applications um, that will be created with trusted and untrusted parts, trusted being an uh, SGX enclave and untrusted being all the bootstrapping code that allows us to share information with our C2 and process payloads from that. Um, and then we're going to go into how high level um, you know, mapping of the calls into C2, into trusted area happens and we'll, how we can leverage some of the primitives in the SGX uh, SDK for our purposes, such as uh, configuration, signing, and loading. Um, specifically, the problem of payload transfer uh, can be distilled to a few things. Well, first of all, we do not want to load payloads in clear. We also always want to protect. And commonly we protect it with some XOR key, maybe AES key, uh, but uh, the problem is that the key itself may be available in the memory uh, because it's shared key a lot of times. And so it's inspectable, if not real time in the sandbox, then in the forensic lab, right? And so if we're running long-term uh, campaign, we want to make sure we protect our keys in memory. And also the other thing is the algorithm itself can be reversed and we can be, um, you know, pretty much our, 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 our algorithm can be known, uh, but not because uh, we don't want to share the algorithm, but because that algorithm may point to weaknesses in our communication, which may be uh, introspected and intercepted. And so uh, what we're going to do, the other goal is not only to store payloads, but also use SGX to secure communicate out to C2. To do that, there are a few alternatives. Um, there, there are some uh, uh, crypto libraries that come with PSW, the platform code, and SDK. Uh, it's SGX TS crypto, TC crypto library. Um, it is fairly limited in what it does because its purpose is to facilitate jobs of attestation and communication for session uh, management. Um, it, it's not for general purpose crypto, uh, but we can use some parts of it to construct what we want. Um, we can also bring third party to uh, encryption to work with that, for example, OpenSSL uh, or Wolf SSL library. Uh, but the problem is target availability. Um, we do not know if these libraries uh, runtime are going to be available on the target. Plus, we want to stay away from loading things from disk as much as we can uh, and operate in memory. And a lot of times it's too heavy or impossible to load those libraries in memory. And the third possibility is obviously with the limited um, uh, kind of API that we have inside of the SGX enclave, the trusted area, we can roll our own, which is um, which is probably discouraged uh, in this ex exercise anyway. 
Um, and um, the you know I mentioned limited uh, access to API and SGX enclave. The reason being is because it is itself um, because of its kind of reason for existence to protect the the code uh, inside of it. Uh, it's devoid of support for syscalls and it has a very limited I/O uh, in and out of uh, enclave, mo mostly for state uh, preservation, but nothing less. Um, so let's see what we can do. We're going to take the the first approach is uh, actually using TC Crypto uh, and see what we can what we can do, how we can build it. Um, so w upon research, we kind of came up with three different things that we can do with that crypto uh, in the SDK. We can generate an RSA key, uh, actually a pair, a public and private key. Um, we can actually sign something with our public key. Um, and, uh, well, actually encrypted with the, with the public key and, 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 and signed with the private key. And we can actually use... Uh, a, a, a routine that works on AES uh, symmetric keys uh, to be able to encrypt something uh, of a value inside and potentially transfer that something, uh, that piece of code or data outside of the enclave into untrusted area. And so the idea here would be for us to create an application where we uh, do just that. The first step would be to generate RSA keys uh, set inside of, inside of the trusted PRM uh, inside of Enclave, uh, give the pr uh, the public key out to our C2, uh, have it stored there, and then go to C2, and C2 would be able to generate the symmetric key, uh, send it to us inside of uh, the trusted PRM. We're going to store the symmetric key, and then uh, we're going to have a shared symmetric key without leaking it, so we can um, kind of generate payload on the C2 side and then uh, keep transferring it into our trusted PRM without having any inspection or uh, being worried about the algorithm uh, disclosure or payload disclosure or key disclosure, right? So um, it's a uh, it's three-step process. First, we're, we're generating uh, public-private keys. Uh, we're sending them to C2. C2 now has them, then encrypts a symmetric key, sends it to us. We store it in the, um, in a, uh, in a trusted component, which it decrypts um, uh, the um, uh, the key because it was encrypted with the RSA which we already had from previous step and then we just share uh, the symmetric key between the two and that's how we achieve secure communication. Um, and then uh, so components that we want to have in in, in, in this sort of uh, construction is we kind of thought of splitting it in three ways: the application which will be inspectable by defense and it's loaded from disk it's your your kind of implant or cradle or loader um, we went the route of establishing the bridge between enclave and, and that loader which kind of facilitates uh, and brokers interaction um, takes data from one passes to another but it's also uh, a kind of a middleman that can be taken out of the equation upon uh, first load so the edr will not see all of the picture and the bridge can come in as a memory loaded module which will be able to kind of broker uh, communication between the two, the enclave and, and, and the app at the runtime. And so the bridge is also assumed inspectable uh, and then enclave, which is uh, assumed obfuscated. We're going to have some notes on that later on in, in the limitation section. Um, but um, but yeah, so enclave is, is where we're going to store our keys and our algorithm. It will be loaded from disk, um, but it's also a secure library, which may not be introspectable and um yeah then um then we need to kind of start building that um and so we come up with that exclave system which we're going to demo um and then we'll come back to to talk more about uh its construction limitations and all of the other things let's take a look at the exclave its components and its operations here we have a victim machine with an application, which is an agent or an implant. There's a bridge DLL, which facilitates interaction with the, uh, the enclave. It may or may not be on disk. It may or may not come directly from the network and being loaded that way in memory. And obviously, as we mentioned, there is a uh, trusted piece of code that runs in PRM. It makes sense to kind of put the code in perspective and so far just to explain 
those components. The application uh, finds the bridge, the bridge uh, function is invoked, which is explore, exported and found. The bridge itself maps through the EDL to the enclave calls. Here's the uh, EDL, essentially it's a mapping um, or a matrix of trusted calls that we can invoke inside of enclave and untrusted calls that we are not. And enclave itself is the trusted code that essentially does the processing, does the encryption and um, other things that we need to keep secure. And obviously on the other side, it's a C2 that um, should be able to match the, the crypto parameters one-to-one -one, so it's able to successfully decrypt and communicate with um, with with exclave that resides inside of the victim uh, machine um, and um, uh, let's take a look at how that works so essentially we have two screens one is the victim machine uh, where all these components are uh, deployed and there is a CE2 let's start the CE2 uh, it listens on the port and it's responding to communication. Let's start the application. And the first thing it does, it's trying to create an enclave. It's a standard procedure to create the memory mapping and launch things into existence. Once this is done, um, all checks happen. Are we running on the machine that supports SGX? Are we able to create it? What are the parameters and permissions that uh, allow us or not allow us to do this? And then um, it's trying to generate a RSA key pair for communication. Once this is done, the public key and private key are available. Private key gets stored in uh, Enclave and public key gets shared through the bridge into the application which connects to the C2 and solicits for a storage of this uh, public key on our side. Once this happens, the C2 uh, carries out the task does its processing, generates the symmetric key for communication, and sends the response back to the application, which proxies it to the bridge into the enclave, which stores it. And this is what we're doing here. So the shared key is now available. Um, and now we are ready to uh, map one-to-one -one encryption of the uh, payload or would-be payload that would come from C2 into the enclave again through the app, through the bridge, into the secure area and this is what's happening here we're requesting that payload the payload um, gets generated in this case it's a very contrived example um, and uh, it gets encrypted to match the mode of the capabilities of the enclave um, all that processing happens and the payload travels back to the uh, to the agent and ultimately to the uh, enclave and uh, Enclave, having the symmetric key, is now able to decrypt the payload. After this is done, um, you know, the payload gets uh, stored in clear text in the Enclave, uh, but it's protected from any kind of uh, reachability from the defense, and then um, the attacker can actually work on that. And uh, last but not least, uh, once we created the Enclave, we can destroy it if we don't need it for whatever reason and, it's, uh, and, and the duration that uh, we want to use that. Once this is done, everything is good and we are ready to move on. Okay, so uh, we saw a presentation of uh, how Exclave works. Um, there are some assumptions and limitations to this. First of all, it's a bad coding practice. <laughs> we are weakening the enclaves. We're using it. We're using. We're misusing them. Um, and so, but uh, our idea is that uh, while the technology uh, can be used as is, uh, a lot of times uh, EDRs do not uh, inspect uh, enclaves. Um, in our in our testing, we were able to uh, to use pre-release keys uh, or in in, in pre-release or debug mode where we're able to compile that uh, and then use the whitelisting uh, testing signing keys uh, to do that it will in theory that should uh, prevent us from debugging into it which is true um, the EDRs themselves do not actually make the leap on and inspecting enclaves anyway um, and so the other side of the story is that in order to do it properly you need to assign at the station key and have Intel provision one and sign it with its root key and then you can sign your enclave which will be undebuggable, right? 
But uh, in this case, you're running uh, into attestation, meaning attribution uh, issue, right? And so we kind of went the other route and said, hey, what can we do with pre-release or debug versions of it? And so not attested downclaves uh, are are supposed to be inspected, but in practice, uh, they're always not. They're often not, right? And so, as we mentioned before, SJX uh, provisioned uh, the PSW uh, services install or uh, platform is installed, and uh, TC Crypto um, a library of cryptograph cryptographic primitives is present. So that should uh, let us kind of living live off the land once we arrive at SJX uh, enabled machine. And, uh, you know, one thing to notice is that uh, how do you help defenders uh, kind of understand what the enclaves are and, and uh, how to find the rogue ones is that you need to watch for signatures, identify non-approved SDX enclaves. The way you would do this is you basically can have really nice uh, tool from uh, Kodelsky's SDX fun to dump uh, your DLL and kind of see the um, the details of that uh, enclave and kind of latch on to the uh, keys that you have not provisioned. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody who has come to my talk. Uh, here's the link to a proof of concept, the bridge library, the enclave and application, which we've used in this in this presentation. Thank you very much.